uh, citalopram, 2D6, PM, poor metabolizer. Oh, okay. And then, okay. Oh, then that then, makes sense, because this doesn't make sense. You need that other no. information. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. okay. I don't yeah. know if I have a screenshot in here of that, but if, that, if I do, it'll make more sense. Okay. So first thing we do, here's your genes. Here's, here's the genes we look at. Here's your actual genotype. Here's the predicted outcome. Then we take all of that information and apply it to the individual drugs. Okay, so speaking of SLC6A4 or the <laughs> serotonin transporter gene, um, you know, how many antidepressants act on serotonin pumps? Most of them. So SSRIs specifically work on that. SNRIs do that in norepinephrine. DRIs like Wellbutrin completely bypass that. Um, tricyclics work on serotonin and norepinephrine. So most of your antidepressants work on the serotonin transporter. The SSRIs are completely dependent on that serotonin transporter. And as it turns out, you can have um, really three different um, variants here. You can have the long, the LA, which is your normal, completely dependent on the serotonin transporter. All right. Um, so I know that's a hot mess, but this is sort of <laughs> the goal of doing this genetic testing, right? So right now, somebody fails a drug or somebody starting new, a new antidepressant, what do you do? You know, what do you pick? Um, ideally, these genetic results will point you in a specific direction. For example, if they're short, if they have the, one of the short genes, they're a carrier, they're at risk for SSRI failure, well, let's consider as an SNRI, mirtazapine, Vibrid, Brintolex, you know, all other things being equal, let's consider these drugs. But what if they're short, short, and they also happen to be a val now? Well, then I might want to consider Wellbutrin because this person's going to benefit from a dopamine boost. But yeah, or if, even sertraline. Well, it's yeah, little. within the SSRIs. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. right. But it should, you know, short, short predicts poor yeah, response yeah, right, to sertraline yeah. anyway. Okay. What if they have the MTHFR variant? Then I probably really want to augment them with a methylfolate product. Um, with well, an SSRI? Or? Yeah, yeah, so the okay. best responses are an SSRI or an SNRI plus folate, methylfolate. And that's with an LA? Yeah, if, I would, yeah, if okay. they were long, long. You know, this, is, this is all assuming yeah, that yeah. we're not going to give them an, an SSRI. Okay. Right? okay. You can omit you can an SNRI with methylfolate okay. also. Um, you know, BDNF, we talked about this earlier. Caucasian net carriers respond better to SNRIs and tricyclics. Asian met carriers respond better to SSRIs. So this is all relevant information. Helps you help steer you in a direction towards medications that are more likely to be effective. All right, so here's mirtazapine. They looked at mirtazapine uh, with patients that were short, short. If you were short, short, you had more responders compared, in, compared to if you were long, long. If you were long, long, you had more non-responders um, than if you were short, short. So if you're short, short, we're thinking of, of drugs other than SSRIs. Mirtazapine, in this case, is a pretty good choice because mirtazapine and short, short have higher response rates. Okay. How often is mirtazapine your first-line drug for a depressed patient? <laughs> probably never. Well, if you have this information, it's probably a good first choice. All right, here, here's... Um, Here's pindolol. I don't think anybody uses pindolol anymore. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anybody? You guys even know what pindolol is? No. Okay, so it's a beta blocker, an old beta blocker um, that they used to use to augment SSRIs, right? If you were short, short, and you didn't augment with pindolol, you saw lower response rates to Lubox. But if you threw pindolol in there, your response rates were pretty equivalent to those that were long, long. So here's another augmentation strategy based on genetics, which improves outcomes. Um, so lithium augmentation. Here's lithium. Um, when you augment an antidepressant with lithium, you saw significant uh, increases. And I think this was response or remission. Um, whatever it was, you, had, you saw better results um, if you added lithium. To short shores? No, but so, this tells you that. Okay. Now, I, first I wanted to establish that lithium works okay. as an augmentation strategy. Now, if you look at it with short shorts, you saw better response rates to lithium in the short short patients. And then people started wondering, well, how does that work? 
And as it turns out, lithium increases the expression of the serotonin pumps. If you're short, short, you underexpress serotonin pumps. One of the ways to fix that is to give you lithium. It increases the pumps, and SSRIs now become more effective. Um, TMS. What do you guys think about TMS? That's all right. I like it. It works. We're studying that the Are last you? half of the okay, class. So. Yeah. Yeah. TMS is sort of the you know, kinder, gentler ECT, um, and those that are long, long have better response to TMS than those that are short, short. So that's predictive. All right, any questions about serotonin? No? Okay. Um, so ion channels, uh, this is kind of unique to us. We're the, we're the only ones looking at ion channels, but we think it's important because of the, the association with bipolar disorder. And, and when, you're, when you're in practice, what you'll, what you'll notice is there's a lot of overlap between bipolar depression and just regular old MDD. And one of the questions you'll have is, I'm not sure, what are they? Are they bipolar depression? Is this bipolar depression or not? This information um, gives you some underlying physiology which may help steer you in the direction of saying, yeah, this probably is bipol bipolar. Maybe I should go look at mood stabilizers or atypicals. So here's some bio 101, glutamate, right? Excitatory, the most excitatory uh, of the neurotransmitters. It causes its excitation by opening up a sodium channel, which propagates the signal, and then ultimately opens up uh, a calcium channel. And opening up that calcium channel usually releases a neurotransmitter downstream. Patients that have variance at sodium or variance at calcium are hyper excitable. They have too much neuronal transmission. Here's the calcium channel variance. They measured it. If you had the AA genotype, that's the fast genotype at the calcium channel, you had a lot more calcium transmission than if you had the normal GG genotype. So too much neuronal excitation, let's slow down this excitation. Any drugs come to mind that slow down neuronal excitation? That's a fantastic statement right there. Who said so they that? studied Who said that? traditional oh. calcium channel blockers <laughs> like nemotipine and isratipine in bipolar patients, and they worked. So this was a preliminary trial. It was only like 20 subjects, but they're gonna expand this and see if calcium channel blockers actually treat bipolar disorder, okay? Um, yeah, I remember reading some old studies on yeah. using um, yeah. calcium channel blockers. Yeah, that's been around for at least 20 years, yeah. and now yeah. they're revisiting it with this new genetic mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. I wanted to introduce Dr. Mary Rosedale, who Hi. just came in, She's and she's going to be speaking, and he just did a slide on TMS. I know, I know.